Welcome back to another episode of the Pursuit Zone Adventure Travel Podcast. I am your host, Paul Schmid, and I interview explorers from around the globe to bring you their exciting stories. These are people that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. This is episode 159 with Allison Young. I met Allison at the Outdoor Adventure Expo here in Minneapolis back in April, where she was giving a presentation about her trek to the K2 base camp in Pakistan that she did in the early 1990s. And I thought it was a very interesting story, so I invited her to be a guest on the show. If you want to get in touch, you can send me an email at paul at thepursuitzone.com or leave me a voice message at speakpipe.com slash thepursuitzone. And now, let me introduce my guest. In the middle of the Karakoram Range in Pakistan is a place called Concordia. It's where the Baltoro Glacier meets the Godwin-Austin Glacier. It's a place known as the Throne Room of the Mountain Gods because it's surrounded by four 8,000-meter peaks, one of those being K2, the second highest peak in the world. In 1994, Allison Young found herself in Islamabad, visiting her father who was stationed at the U.S. Embassy. Wanting to trek to Concordia, she was able to tag along on an overland journey with a Dutch and German couple. It was a difficult and hazardous 25-day trek that you can learn more about at AllisonYoungProductions.com. Allison Young, welcome to The Pursuit Zone. Thanks so much for asking me to do this. It's great to look back so many years ago. <laughs> well, how did you get into going to all these wild places that you go to and that you have been since? Well, back then, uh, my experience had been backpacking mostly in the Sierras and in Texas, um, the Southwest, some up in New England as well. Um, My earliest memory as a child is actually at like three years old, looking down at my feet and watching them walk in front of me and where they could take me. And that's pretty much how I've always been, always wanted to walk, always took adventure walks, even if it was just a matter of, you know, walking in the backyard and exploring, exploring around our neighborhood. Uh, There was a book that came out in, gosh, must have been the 80s, about Annapurna. It was a woman's place. It was the first all women's uh, team that went to the top of one of the most dangerous mountains in the Himalayas. And I was really taken with that. I wasn't so sure I was going to become a mountain climber, but I was fascinated with um, wanting to take my feet, just like I did as a kid, and uh, go to really, really, really beautiful places. And the opportunity came up because my father um, was stationed in the American embassy, as you mentioned, as a foreign service officer. And the first thing I said was, I want to come visit and I want to go up to the Karakoram. At that time, had you done anything such as going to a Karakoram type place before before this? I visited this boyfriend in college. He was living in South Africa, and uh, I went there to see him. And we uh, hiked, and we went into like the deepest caves in the world, the Kango Caves. That was pretty intense. I learned there that I have claustrophobia, <laughs> and. That was probably the wildest trip I did. I'd been to Europe. I uh, um, had hiked in other places. But up till then, I hadn't gone to as many places as, as I've been to now. What do you remember about Islamabad during that time? It was a real international city. It still is to a degree now. Benazir Bhutto was the prime minister at the time. And she wore her veil draped around her shoulders. That's something you often see uh, Pakistani women do. They don't completely cover themselves. So it wasn't so much in Islamabad that you got the sense of a much more conservative country. I saw that in other places where women were completely covered up. It's daunting as pretty much, you know, a free uh, person making my own money, uh, having my own life, living alone, unmarried at the time, to see a, a different culture like that. But as I mentioned, Islamabad didn't feel as oppressive, I guess would be the word to use, as some of the other places. Once you got there and you decided that you wanted to make this trek into the Karakoram, how did you end up meeting this, these overlanders that you connected with? (laughs) Well, and that was the crazy thing. So, I mean, I could have just 
decided I was going to do this trip and sign up for it and pay some money and go with an American guide or something like that. But I guess it just didn't really quite come together. And so I arrived in Pakistan with very few plans, drove up to uh, Gilgit, which is in the Hindu Kush, and went to a polo match. And this was played by the two main towns in Hindu Kush. They come up to this high pass and play polo, which is an ancient uh, sport that comes from this region, uh, from like the 6th century BC, I think is when they think it was invented. A lot of, of Europeans, um, very, not so many Americans, but a lot of Europeans were there, and Benazir Bhutto came to the game. So we were camping in this beautiful meadow and uh, spending several days there. And I was just kind of talking to people and you know, mentioned that this is something I really wanted to do, was to go to Concordia and K2 Base Camp. And one gal said to me, oh, hey, wait, Charlotte and Manfred are doing that. I was like, they are? Well, let me go talk to them. Which, of course, when you travel, you know, you do more of that. You do more of talking to folks and and kind of just picking up with people. I mean, so much less than you do in your own real life. I mean, we get into kind of our own space and our own routines. But so many adventures happen that way where you've just met. So Charlene and Manfred are from Strasbourg and they were up there and, and I just got to talking with them. Really, really lovely people. Uh, they also did the same thing. So I was sort of like the second generation of hooking on to a, another group's trip. Bas and Engele are Dutch, and it was originally their private trip. Um, they'd only found out that Engele just like weeks before was pregnant. So, I mean, she wasn't really showing, but it was going to be like this kind of last thing that they did before um, they had a family. So Charlotte and Manfred said, you know, let me talk to them because the reason they wanted us to go is because it's very expensive to go in just a small group because you sort of still need the same number of porters to do a lot of the work and carry a lot of the things. And if you have more people, it spreads out a little bit better. And they thought maybe they would get better food. So they called them up and they said, yeah, bring her along. You know, they kind of vouched for me that I was fit and, and really ready to go. And and uh, and that's kind of how that thing worked out. The end of the story is that Charlotte and Manfred continued overland all the way to Japan then took a flight to Hawaii and then took a flight to the United States and continued overland. So they visited me um, several months later. Are you still keeping in touch with any of them? No. And I mean, this is something I this is like a project is to try to figure out where they are. And, and I have not found them on Facebook and, you know, just kind of lost, lost track. Once uh, kind of the plan was hatched, what happened next? I mean, how much, how much time did you guys put into planning or was it sort of sounds like they already had the plans they were going and you were just now right. jumping yeah. on board. So what did you need to do to get yourself prepared? Did you need to, to buy any gear or, or what did you do? <laughs> well, it got a little bit crazy. I mean, I kind of knew I was going to do something in the mountains. So I brought boots with me and clothing and a, you know, a kind of large day pack and, you know, some food items, which I always suggest people, if you, if you can bring it into the country, some, some snacks that are, you know, that, that make you feel like home because it's a long, very remote trip. But it was a matter of days really before they were leaving. I mean, it was all of a sudden, it was like, we're going. And if you want to come, it's now or never. And so I didn't have things like a tent or a sleeping bag and they were really going cheap. They hired a guide who was not with a company, which can, you know, normally supply you with a lot of things. I mean, most people don't want to rent a sleeping bag. That's a pretty personal thing, but you know, they can make sure you have the right tents and stuff. And I didn't have any of that stuff with me. So as it turned out at the embassy was a guy who had been on some treks and uh, helped supplied some, some mountaineering trips. And he'd been up to like camp two on, on uh, K2. So he had gear. It was just really outdated and, and kind of funky. He had this little silver tent, um, you know, to kind of keep the, the light from, you know, refracted from it, because of course you're out of any tree line for the entire time, the entire time you're up there. And so he had this little tent that I borrowed and a sleeping bag and a pad and stuff, but it was a little bit old school and, you know, and it was a guy, so it was a little bigger, although he was a pretty short guy. So I think I was fine in that, but I borrowed stuff from him and he had a climbing rope I borrowed and harness and things like that too, because we were going to go over the pass at the, um, at the end of the trip. 
and it's a little bit dicey. So you kind of want a, a few items of climbing gear. And I just started all my gear that I had and thought about any food I wanted to take. We went to the, you know, to the commissary and bought stuff. And then I would just remember being really stressed out about when we were going to go. And we were supposed to take a flight out of, out of Islamabad directly to Skardu, which is a very exciting flight because you go over the Karakoram and you see all of these magnificent mountains. You fly really close to Nanga Parbat. But then they, they called and they would say, oh, we can't fly today because the clouds are too low. So in some ways, you know, I was like, oh, shoot, we're not leaving. But there was another part of me that was kind of relieved because I, I sort of didn't feel ready. I mean, it was like I had all my stuff laid out and, you know, and I had a big duffel bag and I knew I could make this work. But I was kind of like not emotionally ready. I was a little bit nervous. Once we decided to go, because we couldn't wait any longer, it was like day after day after day of cloud cover. It was like, we're going now and we're just going to have to rent uh, a vehicle. I don't know if you know the answer, but why, since they're in an overland vehicle, didn't they just take that? Why did they have to rent a van? Oh, no. My friends from Germany, um, no, they were traveling overland, but by bus and by train and by whatever they could get. Oh, they, they, didn't have a, they didn't have a car with them. I see. I, I imagine they were in a big Toyota Land Cruiser. No, no. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of funny. No, overland just meaning that they were going from it, through every single country. So they entered Iran and they entered, you know, all the all the countries along the way to get from uh, Germany to Japan. So what was the drive like to Skardu? Oh, well, this gets really kind of nuts. So the way it works is, you know, you go to the airport. I mean, I suppose you could stay at home, but basically everyone's checked in to get on their flight. And then they just decide, you know, five minutes before the plane's going to leave, or they might say it's delayed, but pretty much in the morning, they know if any flights will go. So we, we rented this vehicle. My memory is like 13 or 14 hours. I think it's longer than that, though. I think it took actually almost overnight because I remember falling asleep in the vehicle and just being like massively uncomfortable and miserable. And I don't think we necessarily. Oh, no, we did. We stopped at a little like a little tea house and got some rest on beds. But it was like the middle of the night. And then we just got right back into the van and just continued going. It's a really, really long drive. And it's a road that has, you know, it's kind of famous for lots of hazards. Um, there's lots of rockfall. You're on a pencil thin road that's on the edge of a cliff. And they don't have guardrails in a lot of these places. So you're just, it's, it's you know, Indiana Jones. It's exciting. But, you know, you kind of see your life passing before your eyes. And like the people in Pakistan say a lot, inshallah, you know, God willing, I'm going to make it. So that was a pretty wild time. And I think in some ways it bonded us as friends, um, especially the women. I mean, we, we all were suffering. It was, it was hot. It was dusty. It's far Everybody feels just a little bit off on their stomach from the food. I mean, you know, not massively ill, but just not quite right. And meanwhile, you're getting, you know, car sick because you're going around these curves. It was intense and exciting. But, you know, as I talk about it now and I'm laughing, there's a part of me that thinks, gosh, I'd do that again in a minute. You know, one of the, one of the, um, one of the pictures I showed you, too, at the expo was going across those bridges with the signs and it said dead slow, <laughs> which just cracked me up. You see that a lot, you know, these kind of using English in a funny way. I mean, it's not quite the way we would say it, you know, five miles an hour limit or something. We might, we might be more specific, but dead slow is like dead serious. They know exactly what you're talking about. What's uh, once you got to Skardu, what was that place like? Well, Skardu is kind of a, frontier town. It was a fort town and um, it's a beautiful place. You're right on the Indus River and it's beautiful and the mountains just rise above it. But the town itself is just packed with people. And and actually it was a little dicey because, you know, the girls, we kind of bonded, Charlotte and Angela and me, and we went out and walked out on a day when, you know, they're got, trying to get everything together. And, you know, we're wearing long sleeves and we're wearing hats and we're you know, trying to be respectful by, as far as dress goes. But we had like rocks thrown at us. I mean, not to hit our bodies, but like to hit the dirt near us. And it was, you know, kind of making a statement like women shouldn't be out by themselves. And, you know, what are you doing in our town? 
But on the other side of it, I mean, Skardu has seen everything because that's where all of the climbers come through, tourists come through, and um, you need to get your permits and everything together here. And usually you're, you're collecting your food here for the long trek. And so, you know, it's probably a little bit cynical, but uh, by the same token, you know, they depend on tourism. I thought it was an interesting place to visit. I didn't want to spend a lot of time there. We had a reasonably decent hotel and did spend a lot of time kind of organizing our stuff because you have a lot of sitting around and waiting until all the papers are in in order and then you can go. So one of the days we actually were just like putting wax on our boots. And it's a kind of funny thing because I learned that from Boss. He he waxed all of our boots, which kept them like super supple because we had to go through water a lot. And and he also taught me this other thing that was great that I still do to this day. He just took athletic tape and just taped his entire foot. And you never get a blister ever because <laughs> your foot's like encased in athletic tape. I mean, you have to change it. But I just remember that tip from, gosh, this has been almost 25 years ago. And I still use that tip to like manage my feet when I'm hiking. Well, what do you remember about the whole process around buying supplies and getting permits? And was it a big bureaucratic headache or was it pretty easy? Um, It's kind of a bureaucratic headache. But I think that the thing is, is in this region, it's a um, restricted zone. And so you have to have a guide and they're supposed to do all of that stuff. So that's kind of why we had a lot of free time to have rocks thrown at us and tape up our feet. (laughs) But the other thing is, I do remember is how many times I showed my passport like insane number of times. I'm not sure if this is the same way it is today, but there's just checkpoints everywhere. And I have no idea if it's kind of a, you know, begging for money or whatever they call that, you know, wanting a little kickback or something every time you go through somewhere, a little bribe. I don't think so. I mean, I think it's just the way that they keep the area as safe as possible because, you know, tourists are going up there in a country that has a lot of problems and a lot of danger. And uh, I think they want to make sure that each area they've got their papers in order and the right people are going through. But I must have shown my passport, you know, 50 times in just getting from Skardu up to the beginning of the track. I mean, just in all these different places and back. How many guides did you have? How many porters did you have? Just the one guide, Imam, is what he wanted us to call him. And I was pretty naive. Uh, I thought it was his name. Um, Imam, of course, just can mean leader, but it usually has a a spiritual significance. So I think he wanted us to consider him kind of our our, uh, preacher or our, you know, leader in that sort of sense. He had an assistant with him who probably wasn't in charge of carrying anything, but in charge of kind of keeping everybody in order and keeping an eye on where all the stuff was and and who was doing which, which job. They call him a sirdar. It's the like the head porter. And for the most part, the porters didn't speak English. English is an official language in Pakistan, but they spoke very little. And it's just kind of what they picked up. So difficult to communicate directly. But the porters themselves were pretty much the most amazing people. And most of them are not from Skardu. They're from further along up towards where the trail begins in Escole. And they probably were living mostly subsistence lives, you know, as farmers. And this gives them an opportunity to make more money and maybe have a little bit more of an exciting life than just being in their in their home um, uh, town. But they, you know, they were dressed really poorly, um, shabbily, I guess is probably the best word to describe it. And some were not always well, I mean, they would come to me because I seem to have a lot of supplies with me. I, I carried a, a really big first aid kit because I was really worried um, about getting sick or hurt. And I pretty much used all my first aid to help the porters with just this and that kind of issues, you know, cuts that wouldn't heal and just different stuff. So that was a pretty tough thing to see. But I should say that when I came back, we spent some time briefly in one of the homes of a a Jeep driver, because you go by Jeep once you leave Skardu to go up to Escole. And it was such a beautiful setting. And they they really focus on schools and they keep their girls in schools and stuff. So it's not as, you know, grim a life as maybe my assumption would be. You know, it was really a beautiful place. Um, So I would probably say that on the whole, we had like 10 people with us. Some came with us the whole way and then others would peel off. I mean, once food had been eaten or, you know, whatever had been delivered um, and it was finished, they would go back to get another trip 
and be hired by that group. So you take a Jeep to Escole, mm-hmm. and then that's where you the road ends and you have to get out and start trekking. Um, what, what's it like once you start trekking from that point to get mm-hmm. onto the glacier? Yeah, I mean, that was pretty crazy. So we were in this Jeep and and things are just even bumpier and cr- and wilder on the road and the road is washed out. In fact, there was one place where it was just gone and everybody just got out and they just tried to push the Jeep over the rocks. I mean, if they can't get over it, then you just have to walk all that way. And it's a lot of miles. But once you get to Escole, which t- took about a day and it's, it's really quite lovely. I mean, you see fields of, of, you know, green and, and, um, it, it's farms and they have a lot of water cause you know, it's coming down from the Braldu river. But once you suddenly get there, it's like the Jeep stops and it's like, everyone out, here we go. And you've been sitting and you know, you've been waiting for the, tra- the the plane to take off and it never does. You're driving for about two days. You're in Skardu for at least a day organizing everything. And then you're driving this other day. And all of a sudden, it's just like a shock that you have to you have to start walking now. I and mean, you don't even know if your legs will work. Fortunately, someone handed me a, a walking stick. I mean, it was just like a piece of, of a tree. And they'd kind of carved it a little bit. So it was kind of nice around my hand because I really used it and I really needed it. So that was kind of helpful. And it was a weird juggling of everything going on there. It was supplies. It was more people trying to get on your trip to to work with you. It was other trips that were finishing. And actually, we ran into a group um, that was coming down from Broad Peak, which is one of the 4,000 meter peaks. It's one of the most beautiful ones. And they put a flag on top of Broad Peak from their brand new country, which in 1994 was Bosnia Herzegovina. And I was really touched by, you know, by the fact that they had come from all this war and everything and had, you know, made this a priority. But they also were doing a service to the to the country and to this beautiful trail by removing garbage. Now, I don't know if they had some kind of arrangement with the government, you know, to give them a better rate because you have to pay money to get a permit um, to climb the mountains. I have no idea exactly how they did it, but it was, it really touched me that they made that effort to do it because, you know, garbage is everywhere and nothing happens to it. It just, it just stays there. I mean, I guess eventually the glacier would chew it up or something, but it's important to bring it out. So I was really touched by that. Do you know what elevation you're at at this point? Um, you're definitely above 10,000 feet. Um, this is where I got altitude sickness on the very first day. And I tend to, I kind of knew that was coming. You know, I try to just drink a lot of water and, you know, go slow and et cetera, et cetera. But I still get the massive headaches. They just come on. And I remember sitting in my tent and just, you know, moaning. And I guess, I guess I just, you know, drank enough water and it's a pretty slow ascent. So they went away. So I was Okay. You're getting into the zone where you'll be affected by the, you know, diminishing air and also like other factors that can affect your lungs, like the dust and the dryness of the air. But I was really lucky because I just got, you know, kind of had the headache and that was it. And then it went away. And then I was I was fine for the rest of the trip. One of the things that they do and you see these all the way up from Skardu all the way to, to Escole is they have a lot of apricot trees and they dry the apricots on their roofs. And so it's kind of beautiful. At first you're like, are those pebbles? Like, what is that? And all of this juice is coming off and it's just like brilliant, almost, you know, electric orange color. And then you realize it's fruit. And so um, they brought a lot of this along. I mean, it's as hard as rock. You kind of have to put it in your mouth and let it sit there and let the juices come out. But Imam, he, you know, he turned out to be kind of a, of a, you know, not very trustworthy guy, funny, and he was kind of flirtatious. And he would do this little shake with his head and he would say, apricots are the best against headache. And we'd all giggle, but he was right. I mean, they were the best because you, you're getting so much vitamin C and the juice. So, uh, so that's how the, those first days went. Once you started walking, once the road ended, your mission, I think now is to get onto the glacier. How long did that take? Yeah, that's a, that's a few days. Gosh, uh, let me see if I can, three days. Is, is this okay. where you're coming into all those kind of harrowing river crossings? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, this is so long ago that I didn't keep a super careful diary. So I can't remember how many days it took us, but it was a lot of days of walking along um, the Braldu River, which if you just look it up in a picture, 
it's unreal how furious and roiling the the rapids are and the color i mean obviously it's coming out of a glacier so there's a lot of silt it's it's like milk tea it's 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 a grayish brown i know that uh kayakers have made it down it but it's like an ultra ultra extreme level of of kayaking i mean you do not want to get into it if you fell into it you it's probably over for you. So you walk along it and you try to stay out of it as much as you possibly can. There was a bridge that uh, was hand built. I mean, it's beautiful. You feel like you're in National Geographic or you're, you know, uh, from something from hundreds of years ago. They just, they just lay these rocks up and then they have, you know, a bridge just made of, of wood and, and grasses. And um, that takes you across. I mean, it didn't feel rickety. I mean, they made a great you know, job doing this, but it, you know, don't slip, don't linger. We got across that one there to had to go to the other side. And then there was some tributaries we had to cross. Um, in one case, they built a pulley box. So you sort of load yourself into this little box and it's with all these little wires. And then someone just sort of pulls you across we took some live animals with us that uh, we were going to eat later. I mean, it's the most efficient way to do it. You can't refrigerate meat. So we, we brought a goat and we brought some chickens and um, the goat and chickens were just separately were loaded into the box and went across <laughs> just like we did. I mean, they had to make it across too. We had a couple of places where we were climbing on really, really steep wall to go across an area that was was water. I, I'm not so sure that had we fallen in, you'd be drawn into the rapids, but that was a pretty dicey area. You know, no, no ropes, no, nothing like that. And a lot of vertiginous cliffs to get over. But the most dangerous place that we arrived at of all is a crossing that you have to make on a river that is just feeding out of another glacier coming into the Braldu. It's not super deep. I mean, it probably goes up near your knee, but it is rushing. And when I arrived, I didn't really know what I was coming to. I mean, no one warned me, no one told me anything. You know, we didn't really have like a check in each day about what was coming up next. <laughs> we, were, we were pretty disorganized. And I saw all these people hanging out at the river and I was like, what's going on here? And there were all these porters that were holding two ropes and they were pulling them tight on each side as though they were playing tug of war. So that as each person tried to cross, they had kind of something to hang on to, a banister or something as they're, as they're working their way across. I mean, almost as though you were on a bridge. And I thought, oh, this looks really cool. And I thought, fun. And I pulled my camera out. And this man turned to me and shouted, no pictures, no pictures. And I was like, what's the deal? And he, was, he wasn't kidding. I mean, he looked fierce. So I put my camera away. And then it was like, you have to take your boots off. And a mom like, threw my boots across the river. And that's when I realized, okay, this is ridiculous. This is serious. I'm glad he made it because it was, it was fairly wide um, because if he hadn't made it, I wouldn't have had any shoes to walk on the rest of the trip. I would have had to borrow something or, you know, some of the guys were just in, in these sneakers. I don't know what I would have done, but they made it. And so I was in bare feet and, and I stepped my feet into the water. And first of all, it was cold because it's, it's ice, it's, it's snow melt, but it was rushing so fast. I thought I can barely stand up. And that's why they had the ropes. And that's why he didn't want a picture. He did. He wanted me to focus and get across that river. I think it was the only time on the whole trip where I was brought back to kind of to reality of this is not just, you know, Disneyland. This is not just a little hike. At this point, you're so deep into it you know, you can't just turn around and go home and, and be out in a day. I mean, you're, you're far up here. So you need to be paying attention. And you, if you were washed into that, it would have been over. So, um, and we weren't like tied into anything. We were just holding on. So I went across quickly and, you know, and it felt like my feet were being cut because the, the rocks were sharp, but they were not, my feet were numb too. So I didn't feel anything. And I got across and I did take a picture from the other side once I'd made it, but it was a little bit harrowing and nerve wracking. And I should tell you that that guide who yelled at me has become a friend. He figures into the story later, Shefi Ahmed, but a really lovely guide of another group, a French group. And I was happy that he, he uh, looked out for me. Are you carrying anything on your back, like a little day pack or anything, or are the porters uh, carrying all of your stuff? No, it's normal that you carry kind of everything that you need for the day. 
So I carry a pack that has, you know, film at that point, it was film, camera, water, uh, you know, any kind of change of clothing, if it's going to be getting cold or raining. I, I brought an umbrella with me, which was a that's very old school. And that was old school. And now it's getting back to new school again. Now people are carrying umbrellas again to use to make my own shade. Uh, so I kept that in the backpack, you know, just kind of any f- snacks and stuff. The porters took my duffel bag and simply strapped it onto their backs as it is. And that was things like the tent and the sleeping bag and, and you know, whatever the other stuff I needed. Aside from the goats and the chickens, I mean, are there, because when I see the photo, sometimes it looks like you could be walking on the moon. Are, are there, do you see any other wildlife? <gasps> oh, no, no. Um, there are uh, wild animals in the Karakoram. They're very shy. I mean, I think there's even like snow leopard up there. Really, really shy. Uh, didn't see anything. And frankly, a lot of them have been uh, killed by the Pakistanis. I mean, there's an area that's near where we were. It's far enough away to be safe, but it's considered the highest battlefield in the world. India and Pakistan are at basically at war over Kashmir, and it's considered part of Kashmir. And they're so bored because nothing ever happens that anytime they see a, a wild animal, they just shoot it because they have guns. I mean, it's really kind of sad. But um, no, to be honest with you, I saw I saw nothing at all. Once you get up onto the glacier, which I think, which is a massive glacier, the Baltoro, like 40 miles long. Are you hiking that entire 40 miles? Um, yeah, you're hiking all the way to the end of it, to the Godwin Austin. So it's far. And, you know, it's funny to refer to mileage, you know, 40 miles is, you know, so that's a pretty hefty hike in, you know, the Sierras. But when you're on a glacier, you know, it's winding and really difficult walking. It's not really super up and down, but it's rocky and has has crevasses and, you know, difficult footing. And at this point, you're taking breaks to acclimatize. So we took one day off. It was raining anyway, which was great because then it made our timing better once we got to the um, to K2 in Concordia. But it was a good day to just you get yourself really into position because you're really going Hi. And what's funny to me is that you started a school at 10,000 feet and the base camps at 17,000, but you don't, I, I don't remember feeling because it's probably fairly slow. I don't remember feeling like, wow, we're really gaining altitude here, but only in the sense that you're starting to get a little less air and, you know, and, and a feeling of oxygenated blood. Were you wearing crampons? No, I didn't bring crampons. I just wore boots. When we got to kind of icy and snowy sections, you just really took care. I think crampons might have been awkward because there's a lot of rock in the ice, except in certain places. Like once you were really close to areas where water was running, um, it was almost like a bathtub. You had to be super careful there um, going across because it was really, really slippery. I should tell you about the Baltoro Glacier. It was it was incredible approaching it because it's really high and there's like a hole, <laughs> this yawning gape where the, where the water is coming rushing out, which is making the Braldu river. And, and it's, it's noisy. I mean, you hear the water rushing, but you hear the glacier moving. It doesn't calve. It, it's not up against a large body of water. You know, it's a river. But it's definitely you get the sense that it's moving, and to get up on it was kind of kind of crazy because, you know, it's like suddenly you're really working your way up. I mean, they they kind of each summer, you know, they they try to work out a path to get up onto it, and it's it's a little awkward. The other thing is is that when you sleep on it, um, you hear it making sound, and it's not quite like the way the the ice in Minnesota is this thundering kind of booming sound. It's more like a ping. It's like, bing, and it goes all the way down, you know, deep into the glacier. And you hear it kind of going off into these, you know, cavernous spaces. It's an otherworldly sound. And I give anything to go back and experience that. When you're walking on it, I mean, is it pretty obvious when you come to a potential crevasse or, or are you guys roped together or is it just a pretty easy walk on this sort of rocky uh, yeah, that's a really good question. There's not in in my case there was no snow on top of um the glacier. So so you can see pretty much everything. You're not going to step into, you know, into a crevasse. You you see them and you come upon them and you just have to have to cross over. I never felt in danger on the glacier. 
except in the places where you could slip. And, but you, you know, you knew, you knew you just had to take, you know, really easy steps there and be careful. And it was good to have a stick. It was good to be with people, you know, I mean, even if someone was on the other side and gave you their hand, it was that kind of thing. Not the way, like, even when you get into the Alps where you could, you know, you could ski right into a crevasse because you can't see it. When you guys got to Concordia, was that the end of your trek or did you guys uh, continue going to K2 base camp? We got to Concordia and set up um, a kind of base camp of our own there and then walked to K2 the next day and took about a day to get there. It was amazing getting up on the glacier because the views of the mountains were just unreal. It was surrounding you. I mean, yeah, there's 8,000 meter peaks there and it's this huge collection of them. But there's, you know, just a little bit shy of 8,000 meter peaks too, like Masher Broom. And they're just unreal. And I had, we had great weather, so we could see pretty much everything. Once you get to Concordia, it's the first time you see K2 because it's hidden until you're there. And you, you know, you literally, er, you stop, turn left, boom, and there it is. And it's just this gigantic pyramid. Harder walking to get there, more ups and downs and undulating glacier and just torn up rocks. It was pretty much a wheezing affair. So went there, visited some people who were climbing and visited the Gilkey Memorial and then and then went back. Can you uh, explain what the Gilkey Memorial is? Yeah, Gilkey was a, a climber. He was an American climber who was on K2 and he developed um, high altitude pulmonary edema, which is life threatening. I mean, I guess to the lay person, I would say it's when um, altitude sickness is, has gone bad. It's gone into your lungs. And he got thrombosis in, um, in his veins and so couldn't walk anymore. And they they put him, his his teammates put him on a litter and, and tried to carry him down. And he slipped away from them and fell to his death. But what they think happened is that he actually undid himself. And I mean, he was conscious the whole time. He just couldn't move. And he just let himself go to sacrifice himself so that his teammates, because um, they were at such a high altitude, they could all go. It's a very, very, very dangerous uh, climbing. K2 is, I don't know if it's the most dangerous of all, but it's its real hardcore climbing from the beginning to the end. There's no walking on it as far as, far as I know. I mean, I've, I haven't climbed it. One in four, I think, is the statistic of who dies when they try to attempt this, this uh, mountain. So the memorial is a pile of rocks basically for his life, but it became uh, a place where people would put other items, you know, to remember those who had died. So what they would do is they would take something like a metal pan and, and kind of punch into it the name of the person who was lost and placed it there. It was, it was pretty stunning. Um, I found the thing that was the most startling about being there, kind of the focus and the intensity of mountain climbers and really like the differing reasons that they were there. I mean, I think they all knew that it was really risky, but they all had had different reasons for wanting to do it. I mean, maybe they were pushing themselves to just see how much they could do. Uh, who knows? But while we were there, literally the moment we arrived, we found out that someone fell, an American fell to his death, um, fixed rope broke. It, I, you know, this can happen. It was just a nobody's fault, except, you know, the elements took out something that he, a piece of equipment he depended on. And then as we were having tea and leaving, you know, pretty much getting ready to leave, people succumbed to high altitude sickness and, and didn't make it. And so it was just, it was so daunting to be like that close to, to death and that close to like a conscious decision to want to put yourself in that kind of situation. Um, I found the whole thing moving and I, but I also felt really rushed while I was there and really dark because the porters don't like being up there. I mean, most of these porters that went with us, from what I could tell, were not people who worked for mountaineering, uh, for mountaineers. They were people that worked for, for tourists, for trekkers. And so they weren't, you know, coming up and supplying. I mean, maybe they would, but they didn't like being around there because they felt the whole thing smelled of death and, and just it didn't feel clean and, and right to them. So there was just a lot of tension. 
but we got out and we came back. And once we got back to Concordia, it was like, oh, there's my little tent. And it was sunny and everyone was happy and dinner was ready and we had time. And so someone heated up water and like washed all of our us girls hair. <laughs> and it was it was like the most luxurious memory. I mean, I can feel it right now. You know, I mean, I think they just wanted to touch us, right? Because you know, we thought they thought we were kind of loose women or something. But but it was actually a very generous act, you know, to to just kind of clean clean us up. And there was really renewing about it too. You know, as though as though you were taking away away the darkness and saying, you know, you're you're alive right now, and and you know, come back to come back to this place. The throne room of the mountain gods. Your presentation was the first time I'd ever heard that uh, phrase, and I I love it. I can't keep, I can't get it out of my head. I keep saying it to myself. Um, it's the name of a book by Galen Rowell, who is a climber. Was a climber. He uh, climbed K two and and what way back in like the seventies or something. He wrote that book, and he called it "In the Throne Room of the Mountain Gods." I love that, and it, and it's and it sticks. I mean, that's what people refer to it as because. Uh, because it pretty well describes what you experience. Yeah, it's a cool phrase. I remember you saying that when you got to the end of your trip, something happened to kind of throw yeah. a monkey wrench into the whole thing. Can you explain what happened? Yeah, everything fell apart. Basically, what happened was Charlotte started to um, get an altitude sickness. She was pretty sure it was that. It could have been foodborne illness, but she was not feeling well. And I think she didn't think she could make it over the um, high pass. And I think Boss and Engla were a little bit sick of us or something. They wanted to do their own thing. And so I was the one who brought some climbing gear. It was in a, you know, like a general pack of stuff. And they just kind of went in and fished it out and decided they were going to go their way. And we were going to be on our own to go back the way we came. It was like super uncool. It's just not the way you do things. I didn't know these people that well. They were strangers to me. And yeah, we bonded, but I mean, on a very superficial level. And the guide went with them. He took them. They were his initial clients. We really weren't. We were tagalongs. So <laughs> we were sort of, we kind of woke up in the morning and they were gone. And it was like, what? And then I kind of felt like I had to be a little bit in charge because, because Charlotte just wasn't well. And it was just, we just needed to, we needed to figure out what to do. We hooked up with some of the porters who were going to go back that way. They didn't need to go over the pass. It's hard. It's longer. It's, you know, it's, it, they just wanted to get back as fast as they could and get hooked up with a new team, get back to their homes. So we continued down. And this is when I reunited my friend, Shafi Ahmed, who was leading a very small group of three French people and they didn't speak any English and my French was, is terrible. So, you know, we didn't speak very much, but he made sure that we were okay. Now they were going over a different pass too, not the same one, but a different one. So they were coming back down and then going over that. So they didn't go all the way out with us, but he made sure that we had like people looking out for us. And there were some people coming off from a K2 group. They were leaving a team that didn't need them anymore. So they were going to go back out. So we just kind of hooked up with them. And then I ended up, Charlotte had to stop and stay overnight one more night somewhere. And I continued out. This is when we were way, way, way close to Escole. And so when I finally came out from the whole trip, it was just me and like 20 guys. <laughs> and it was a little bit weird. But they were so nice and looking out for me. And in fact, the funniest story was once we got on the Jeep at Escola to get back down to Scardu, I really had to go to the bathroom at one point. And we were like in the middle of just, there's, you know, you can't hide behind a tree. It's just, you know, there's nothing here but rocks. So they stopped the Jeep and a um, bunch of guys, they're, they're, they're kind of like, it's a, a Jeep that has like sort of a, a bed in the back. So they're all kind of standing in the back, just riding along. And I got out and I, you know, I sort of found a little rock. And I remember the Jeep driver like backing up in some way to make it impossible for anyone to see me. I mean, he was like being so caring. And I was really touched. I mean, they just looked out for me. And then we ended up going to his home and they treated me like I was a member of the family. I mean, for one thing, a woman is the only one who's allowed to come into the home and see the other women. So that was one of the pieces of it. And they just, 
brought me in and I was introduced to everyone. And it was, it was such a touching memory. And this man was so proud of the fact that you know, he would probably worked as a porter for years and years and years and saved money and then was able to, to buy a Jeep. And then, you know, and, and his life improved because he was, you know, able to be a Jeep driver and, and um, make better money. And it was just a, a really wonderful thing to experience, you know, seeing kind of behind the scenes, how these people live there and their pride. And, you know, and he told me that, you know, all of his, his, his daughters, they're, they're going to school and how happy he was that everyone was studying and, and how important that was to improve their lives too. Um, when I got down to Cascardu, eventually everyone got there. So I, you know, I saw people again and there was a lot of, you know, shaking of fists and, but, you know, we all got out and at that point, what was, you know, what, what could be done? And we weren't going to try to get a helicopter. This was, this was 1994. I didn't bring a sat phone. It was a different time. So that, you know, that, that kind of went like that. And then as it turned out, I got stuck in Scardew too, because even though it looked like perfectly clear skies, there was just enough understory of clouds that the, the planes wouldn't take off. My father got pretty concerned at this point. I mean, he was just like, why did I let you go on this? And I think what happened is he started telling his friends, oh, yeah, Allison's up on the Baltoro Glacier. And they were like, are you insane? You just let her go with people she doesn't even know. So he was really getting concerned then. And what he did was he called someone he knew in Scardu to make sure that I had like a decent hotel room, not in some like low rent trek trekker hotel but in like a nice one and it was it was beautiful it was right on the indus river and you had these cliffs around you and you you know you sat out there under the shade I mean, it was gorgeous but i was three days i couldn't get out and this this man that he had called it really took his job seriously he treated me like a sister but like not in a good way like a sister like he didn't want anyone to to talk to me he didn't like that i was you know seen by anyone or something and so every night we'd have dinner and we'd find out, you know, the, the plane didn't take off. You had another day that you were stuck in Scardu. And I would have dinner with, you know, with the guides and with the, um, not, they weren't porters, but they're like, well, I guess they're all guides at this point staying in this hotel. And, you know, we'd have fun, we'd talk, but, you know, it, was, it wasn't really my, my scene. And there just happened to be two other English people staying at the hotel. And so one night I decided I was going to have dinner with them and, I, you know, I just had enough of like guide talk and all men, you know, so I went and sat with this couple and they were lovely and they were fantastic. And I just adored them. And I said, no, I'm just, I'm bored to death. I need to get out of here and I'm stuck. And, and they said, if we're stuck here one more day, we're renting a Jeep and driving all the way to Islamabad. And I said, please don't leave me here. Don't leave me here. And what happened is the, the fellow that my father had called to take care of me was, came up to me and said, I don't like you talking to those people. And 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 was trying to kind of keep me away from them. And the next morning, you know, I got up and the plane didn't take off. And I thought, Oh no, my friends are gone. My English friends have left and I was stuck another day. And now I didn't have anyone to talk to. And all of a sudden this Jeep pulls up and she's like, Allison, let's go, let's go. And it was like an escape. And I just threw all my stuff into the Jeep and we took off. And she said, you know what I think we should do? I think we should go look at gems. And I thought, what? And we went and bought, which is another way they uh, make a Vardu is um, there's beautiful um, gems that they mine for. And I bought some gorgeous stuff and later made it into a necklace. And that was my, my memory of escape from Scardu. <laughs> but that's how the whole thing ended. I mean, if you didn't have a story like that where everything went wrong, it wouldn't be as interesting a story, right? I mean, the mountains are beautiful, <laughs> but it's the personalities, you know? Yeah, it's always the characters that make the story. It's the characters. <laughs> but I can't find any of them on Facebook. I don't know I don't know how to find them. And maybe if you put this podcast out, they'll find me and sue for defamation or something. <laughs> Looking back, what, what do you think was your favorite part? Oh, gosh. You know, the one thing about being in that altitude, especially in Himalayas or, or Karakoram, is that, you know, the, the color of the sky, it's the deepest, deepest blue you've ever seen. And the air is so rarefied. Uh, just, just being in that, that place, whenever I see a picture, I can, I long for it. And I remember, you know, the, the, the walking and how it felt to be there. I mean, I, I can't say that there's like a specific experience um, besides sleeping on the uh, glacier with the pinging 
sound of the glacier. But I would say, you know, I, I haven't been back to Pakistan, obviously, since then. And I have not been to the Himalayas yet. So that's definitely on the list because that kind of um, experience changes your life. What would have been your least favorite part? Well, <laughs> waking up in the morning with a perfect view of K2 and feeling so happy to be there and then finding my friends gone and just thinking, you know, that's not a good way to be. Don't be like that. And, you know, I think I, I think I might have cried. I might have yelled. I might, you know, got angry. I went through like all of the stages of, of despair. Is that what they call it? The stages of grief, all the stages of grief, you know, denial, they can't be that far ahead, you know, and, and that's a, that's not a good moment to have. So, I mean, I think like your follow-up question on that is going to be like, what did you learn from this trip? You should be very, very prepared and always have a plan B in case things go awry. And it, it's not always like, like you get sick or you get injured or your equipment breaks. I mean, those are all really important things. Or there's an accident of some sort or, you know, there's rock fall and you can't get past this place or the, or the water's too deep to cross. You know, these are all kinds of things that can go wrong. And, you know, you should have a positive attitude to plan something. But one of the things that I, I don't remember in my list because I'm like a super trusting person is that not all people are trustworthy. And I mean, I've learned that since in a lot of countries I've gone to where people will just do things that it's like I'm baffled. I think, I can't believe you're, you're going to steal money from me. No, <laughs> you just lied to me. And I'm always like shocked. And, and it's like, no, people can be that way. Now, I don't think that you should be a pessimistic person or an untrusting person. But I think if you, if you know that there, that people have an, a capability to be that way, then you can be more prepared. There probably could have been more questions I'd asked to make sure that like we didn't split up and make sure that we did something, you know, that was the right thing, like that I still got to go on that piece of it. Um, and Charlotte was still taken care of or made them feel guilty enough so that they wouldn't leave. They can't leave the group. One of our people's sick, you know? So, um, yeah, that was probably my least favorite moment. <laughs> Do I need to ask that follow-up question or was that the answer? <laughs> yeah. uh, you can, if you want, <laughs> you just let me go on and on. I love it, Paul. <laughs> what was your biggest takeaway on the adventure? It's really, really good to plan. I'm a big planner and, uh, you know, I got all the gear going and I, and I know where I'm going to go and, you know, my next trip and, and I, you know, I have the maps and I do everything I can, but you have to be ready to be spontaneous too. And sometimes that can be like in a situation where something bad comes up, the weather just goes to all to hell in a handbasket. But sometimes it can be, I've met somebody and they're offering an opportunity. And so I don't regret, even though things went wrong at the end, and even though it was kind of untrustworthy, and I probably was put in a bit of a dangerous situation, the fact that I was people and say, can I come, is a trait in myself that I like. And I think that's a takeaway too, is to think in your life, like to be aware and be open to possibilities and chances, because sometimes you don't get a second chance. I mean, I have not been back to Pakistan in 24 years. Would I go back? There's so many other places to go in the world. Probably not, maybe, but that was the chance and that was the moment. And so that's a, that's a good lesson to learn too. If somebody else is looking to uh, do a trip to Concordia, maybe go to K2 Base Camp, what advice would you have for them? Hire a good guide. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't have to um, necessarily work with someone from the United States, although, I mean, you know, I love hiring Americans, but my friend Shefi Ahmad, who I mentioned throughout this uh, um, conversation, has his own company, and I would trust him with my life. And I think if you do hire somebody, in country, you can get a you know a bit of a better deal than all the logistics having to be made from here. Um, they do tremendous amount of experience. I mean, how many times have they been up there? They know every step of the way. They know all the people by name. And in fact, it's kind of funny because I did kind of a Facebook thing with Sheffy recently, and we were talking about him, mom. And I mean, he still knows him. He still knows he's around. I mean, you know, he, he didn't go so far as to tell me like, is he guiding trips? I have no idea, but. You know, it's kind of funny. I mean, they know everybody. And so, you know, you have to have a guide up there because it's a restricted zone. And, you, you know, you just want to get a good person 
recently my husband and I went to Peru and we hired a guide um, on a long trek in uh, Vilcabamba. We insisted upon going just the two of us. And so I can kind of see where Bas and Engele were coming from. There's something really nice about having your own trip. Other people, unless they're your best friends or unless you really know how they are as, as travelers, they can become difficult and issues can come up because you'll have different paces and different desires. And usually when you're with your husband or when you're with your, your best friends, that's not the case. So, you know, those might be some, it might be worth the 500 extra dollars or whatever to go just the two of you or the four of you or whatever on a trip like that. But I would highly recommend uh, Sheffy and I can certainly send any of that information to someone who's interested. Yeah. Does he have a website? It's Karakoram Journeys. So it's just Karakoram Journeys or, uh, yeah, karakoramjourneys.com. Okay. Yeah, karakoramjourneys.com. And his name is Shefi Ahmed. Ahmed. I guess I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. They do a little. <laughs> well, Allison, what's next for you in terms of trips? Do you have any uh, other oh, adventures coming up? Always. Um, yeah, I'm leaving in a couple of weeks. Well, no, this I'll be on, I'll be on my trip when you uh, post this. I am hiking the Coast to Coast Trail in England. It goes from the Irish Sea to the North Sea. It's 192 miles. It uh, goes through the Lake District and the Peak District and the North Yorkshire Moors and uh, the Yorkshire Dales. It's a lot of up and down. You do go through town, so it's a very different feel, but I'm going to uh, wild camp. That's the term they use in England. I'm going to wild camp, backpack uh, the whole way. So I'll be up there in the fields and um, getting rained on a lot, I think. But I'm, I'm including a little bit of climbing, too, because uh, folks who climbed, you know, did the first like British ascent of K2, I think is um, Bonington. He did his training in um, the Lake District. So I'll have my hands on some of his handholds. You doing this solo or is your husband going with? I'm doing it solo. My husband and I do like to hike, but we, we have a lot of other interests and I go really, really fast. <laughs> but uh, I have a couple of friends in England who are going to stop by uh, a friend that I um, hiked in South Africa is going to visit uh, for some of it. A, hike, a friend I hiked with in France is going to visit some. And then one of my best friends from high school lives in London, and uh, she's going to come for a little bit too. So we'll see how that all works out. Do you do this on just your vacation time, or are you able to get other time off? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, it's on my vacation time, and that's why I haven't done a really, really long through hike yet. I save it up, and I cram it all together. And I'm I'm a, an on-air host at Classical NPR, so... I work some of the um, really awful holidays. I mean, they're great holidays, but they're not great holidays to be on air, like the 6 a.m. shift on New Year's Day, 4th of July and Memorial Day and all those days. And um, and I also uh, host concerts on Saturday nights. So I kind of save them up and um, and they're willing to let me cram it all together. I'm taking three weeks off to do this. It's a little bit too much time, but it gives me some time to explore more and um, climb and stuff too. Yeah, that'll be fun. Thanks. How can people contact you if they want to learn more? Um, my website is allisonyoungproductions.com. So you can just go there and contact me and follow my blog. Uh, follow me when I go on the uh, C2C because I'm going to blog every day about my adventures and put up pictures and stuff. It should be fun. Okay, Allison Young, thank you so much for coming on the show and telling this amazing, uh, crazy <laughs> back in time story of uh, trekking to K2 in Pakistan. Uh, appreciate it. Oh, yeah. So much fun talking to you, Paul. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you for listening. If you want to support the show, here are a few simple ways. One, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, or wherever you listen to the podcast. Two, you can like the show on Facebook or follow along on Twitter at The Pursuit Zone. Three, you can leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or Spotify. This episode was recorded on May 9, 2018. For the show notes and more great adventure travel podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com. Mm-hmm.